This is the Spirited Talk podcast. Conversations and much more about connecting with our friends and lost ones in the spirit world. And now, here's your host, Trevor. Welcome to another episode of Spirited Talk, being recorded in my sanctuary at my home here in Shevington in the north of England. My guest today is a lady who doesn't just talk to dead people, she draws them as well. Who is it? Stay around and find out. For over 20 years, I've been exploring, developing and unfolding my own psychic and spiritual potential. I started this incredible path as a skeptic with an open but questioning mind and a willingness to listen and learn from some of the world's finest teachers on the subject. Now, after thousands of hours of study, practice and trust, I'm an evidential medium able to communicate with those the other side. Through the Spirited Talk podcasts, I aim to continue my learning through conversations with guests, sharing their stories and knowledge on their specialist areas of spiritual and psychic work. Join me now as we continue on this amazing mission to bring the two worlds that little bit closer. Before we introduce our guest for this episode, may I remind you to subscribe to Spirit to Talk on iTunes or wherever it was you sourced this podcast. To find out other ways you can become part of this community, visit our website at spiritedtalkpodcast.com and Spirited Talk Podcast is all one word. Now it's time to introduce our guest. My guest today has been working with the spirit world from about the age of 32. I've not personally met her before today, but I am well aware of her work and her reputation. My guest is an eminent teacher at the world-famous Arthur Finlay College in Stansted in the UK. Her knowledge and experience spans a variety of aspects of working with spirit. My guest is an evidential medium, trance medium, or a reader and spirit artist. Apart from her work at the college, my guest is available for private readings and spiritual assessments. My guest has a wicked sense of humour and, according to my friends that have worked alongside her, she's a wonderful person to be around with a wealth of knowledge, yet a down-to-earth attitude with everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that lady is Lynn Cotterell. And a very good morning to you. How are you, Lynn? Good to see you. I'm really well, Trevor. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, well, really? Well, that's good. So am I. That's uh, excellent. How are you coping with these horrible lockdown times? Are you loving it? Uh, well, I have to be honest, um, being able to draw as much as I like all day long is really quite a pleasure. Of course, it's horrendous what's going on um, outside of my home. And for those people who have lost loved ones, uh, it must be devastating. Uh, but personally, I'm enjoying uh, just having that little bit of a rest and uh, spending my time doing the things that I like doing for a change. So one of the questions I normally ask, I'm just going to skip through the list here as I look at you on screen and say, this is quite surprising. Are you more introvert than extrovert? I'm a Gemini. So I would say I'm 50-50. Um, there's a big part of me that's extrovert. And I do think that to do this sort of work, there has to be an element of, uh, of ego or an element of the personality coming forward. Um, but I'm not all that you see. Um, I'm like everybody else. I have my nervous moments and my moments where things become uh, a bit overwhelming. But, but I would say 50-50, 50-50. Yeah. I just wonder, because you obviously, like me, you enjoy your own company. So uh, I do. I do. <laughs> absolutely. Right, listen, <laughs> do, really. we've got a script here that took years to create because you're a special person. So let's stay with oh, that goodness. script. Tell us where you are in the UK. Well, I live in a small village just outside Kettering in Northamptonshire. And I'm really lucky because my, my children live in the same village. Both my daughters live in the same village. Yeah, so I'm blessed, absolutely blessed. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know. I thought you were down in um, deeper Norfolk. I, I travel the A, is it the A14, A41? Absolutely. goes past my door. Um, well, really, I've done that well, last <laughs> year. It must have been 100 times. I go down to um, Sudbury, Suffolk, to to deliver, and that's obviously the road through. Wow. That oh, is, absolutely. I will be waving in the future. Well, that would um, be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to, let's start the interview off as we wish to continue. We need to know your story that's what people like can you tell us about um can you tell us about your childhood your family siblings and those early days up to the age of 10 i was the oldest of six children i have three brothers and two sisters so my mum was very clever she 
produced three of each, three boys, three girls. I we lived in uh, various places over the over the years, but um, about the age of ten, I would have been living. Well, I would have been living in Greens Norton, which was a tiny little village toaster in Northamptonshire. And I at ten, I would have just about been going to secondary school. Um, prior to that, I was a very very shy child, very very shy. And I remember my first day of school. Uh, being absolutely devastating because mum took me down to the primary school. And of course, all of my life up until then, I'd been with my family, with my brothers and sisters. And this particular day, I was pushed through a doorway and into a classroom with a lot of people I didn't know. And um, and I, my, my brothers and sisters obviously were all going home. So my mum tells the story of um, my squeal being heard from the end of the corridor. And then suddenly she heard uh, little footsteps running along behind her. And I had managed to crawl out from between the teacher's legs and run along the corridor to get to her. <laughs> so I don't think I was very keen on the idea of going to school on my own. Was it a happy childhood generally, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I'm so blessed. My mum and dad are brilliant people. My mum, unfortunately, has passed the spirit world now. Uh, my dad's 87, but they are f- fabulous people. And I had the most wonderful uh, childhood. And, uh, you know, to be a, um, a sibling of six, uh, you, you grow up learning all those basic things in life. Like, you know, nothing comes without hard work. You, you know, you love the ones that are around you, you care about your, your family. And those are the most important people to you all the way through your life. So, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely blessed. Oh, excellent. Did you um, think or do you think you had a vivid imagination? That's a difficult question. I I don't think so. I I wasn't aware of spirit at that time in my life at all, really. I always grew up with a knowledge that there was something outside of me, but I didn't honestly give it a lot of thought. I was quite creative at school, Um, maybe not in the traditional way. So I wasn't an artist. In fact, Uh, During my years at school, I remember my art teacher, uh, when it came up to exam time, I remember him saying to me, Lynn, really, you probably need to do pottery. Uh, So my, so my, my art wasn't obviously of the standard that he thought was good enough to go in for an exam. So I ended up doing lots of creative stuff. And my favorite subject in those days was needlework. And I still love needlework. Now, the reason asking about the vivid imagination, um, some children have invisible friends or they're great storytellers and that develops in an early age. So, yeah. no, As far as I'm aware, nobody's ever told me I was a great storyteller and I certainly don't have any memory or nobody has ever mentioned me having invisible friends at that time. And what sort of pupil were you at school anyway? Were you the SWAT or were you the... Uh... No, I was very committed, but I wasn't very good at anything. I remember being in um, about 11 or 12, and every time the exam results came out, I got the worst grade. So if the grades were one to nine, I got nine. You know, I was really not very good. And I remember about the age of 14, uh, being at secondary school, and one particular day I got a a message from the headmaster, would I go to the headmaster's office? And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, what on earth have I got to go for? And he sat me in his office and he said, right, Lynn. He said, okay, so tell me what's going on at home. And I said, nothing really. Why are you asking? And he said, well, your results are remarkable. You've gone from being you know, grade nine to getting twos, threes, one in some subjects, you know, I just wondered what on earth had happened and nothing had happened. I think everything had just fallen into place. Hmm. So from then onwards, I was, I studied a lot and I was a good student. I wasn't, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't um, bunk off of school. I was well behaved, you know, I was one of your nice girls. And how did you fit in with the rest of your, uh, your well, your other two sisters and uh, three brothers? Were you uh, a good girl? Were you a handful? Were you daddy's favourite? How did that work? No, I don't think I was dad's favourite. Dad, dad and mum were very even-handed with all of us and loved us all equally. Or, or if they didn't, they certainly didn't show any favouritism. I got on with my brothers and sisters okay, but I was three years older than my my next sister and I'm 13 years older than my youngest brother so you know I didn't have I mean apart from babysitting them as they grew up which I did quite a lot of I sort of grew away from them the older I got I grew away from them to an extent because because I was often into the world while they were still growing up if that makes sense and was there a religion in the family oh gosh yes um, we were brought up in the Catholic religion and in fact my primary school was a Catholic primary school 
my dad was Catholic and my mum was Church of England and my mum became a Catholic to marry my dad. Mm -hmm. So therefore my mum was more strictly Catholic than my dad in a lot of ways. So my growing up years were um, all about attending a Catholic school. So mass most mornings of the week and mass on Sundays and that sort of thing. So I got to the age of 16 when it became my choice. And of course, I very quickly walked away because it had become very much part of my life that I didn't really want. So, um, so once I had the choice, I, I walked away from the, the religious thing. Okay, so let's move on those years. Let's put two figures in your age, your, your sort of teens. Explain what happened. Did your parents encourage a further education? Uh, my parents were very, very, very easygoing. And they very much uh, were of the opinion that if I did something I enjoyed and loved then um, and, and was happy doing it, then, you know, I would, I would thrive. They didn't push me towards further education. I did go into the sixth form, but after a little while in the sixth form, I knew it wasn't for me. Um, so I left school at 16 and went to work then. Right. So you, you didn't go to university? No, I've never been to university, no. No. I, I think if I think back on it, perhaps I would have enjoyed it. Both my daughters have had university educations and they're both very bright. But at the time, it wasn't for me. Okay. And what career did you do? What was your first job rather than career? What was the first job? Well, did? my first job was something I didn't enjoy, which was I worked for National Westminster Bank. So I went and worked in their uh, back room to start with sorting checks and, you know, putting them through some huge machine. I only did that for about a year. I ended up on the cashier's desk, which suited me better because I was talking to people all day long. Um, but still, it wasn't right for me. And uh, I had the opportunity after about a year to apply for a job as a beautician, um, a trainee beautician. So I went then and studied to be a beautician. Were you one of those sorts of girls that were naughty and went out at night? Did you like the, the club life? And... Oh, my goodness, that's a question and a half. I'm revealing secrets here, I can see. Yeah, no, I, yes, I was a bit wild. I had a little bit of a wild time, I think, from the age of about 19 to about the age of 22. I went and lived in Italy. Um, I went and lived in Nice for six months, went and lived in Italy for a year and a bit, learned the Italian language. Why? Um, why? Mm. Why did I go? Yeah. Uh, I think because I wanted to move away from the job that I was in at the time. I'd, I was doing a couple of, couple of a day job and a night job, and it was all very intense. And a friend of mine had said to me, especially the Italian uh, trip, a friend of mine was Italian and said, oh, I've got an address. You can go to Italy um, and stay with this person. They'll, they'll find you some work. And I jumped on an aeroplane with £10 in my pocket, much to my father's horror, because... Uh, I flew to Palermo, which is the capital of Sicily, uh, which is not the safest of places or wasn't the safest of places to go. Um, but I had the most marvellous year there and had lots of different wonderful experiences and, and one or two not so nice experiences um, and came home a different person. So I think it did me the world of good to walk away from where I was and to come back to knowing what I wanted out of life. Mm. Did you fly from Stansted? Was that your first experience of Stansted? <laughs> I don't remember where I flew from. <laughs> it just occurred to me. I thought, oh, that's quite funny, isn't it? Oh, it might have been Stansted. I don't yeah, remember. I honestly don't there we go. For those that are outside of the UK, Stansted has one of the big airports in the UK, which is only a couple of miles away from the famous Arthur Fidley College. So there you go. We're all drawn to certain areas of the country. So... Here's the one. Tell us when you got married. How did that happen? Well, I married a, a really lovely man um, who I still think is a really lovely man. But I'd known him when I was young. I went out with him from the age of um, 17 to about 19 and a half. And then when we broke up, then I had my little wild stage. Um, and, um, and when I came back from Italy, that I came back knowing that I only wanted to be in touch with people that I really liked. I'd got in touch with, I'd, I'd been in, in a, a group of people who really perhaps could have led me very much astray before I went to Italy. So I came back knowing I didn't want to reconnect with those. Um, and I reconnected with David, who, um, who was my husband, and I married him 
um, about a year and a half after that. So when I was about 25, I married him. Okay. I'm, I'm doing that thing that you do when somebody tells you their age and they tell you what era they lived in. Well, I'm like 60 odd years old, so I can think back and I'm looking at you and on the paper here, I'm trying to imagine that era that you lived in. Uh, sort of, well, and you lived in the same era because oh. I'm 62. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm 63 this month. So we lived in this at the same time. We, so, we were... so when I was out there DJ and I was playing the grooves at the uh, at holiday camps down in Weymouth, you were one of those that were dancing to the same types of music, black box, right on time and all of that stuff. Well, we've got another connection here because my ex-husband's family came from Weymouth and I spent many, many years on Weymouth Beach. Well, there you go. So if we were to get together on this one and work it out, it could be that you had a holiday in a holiday camp where I was DJing at the time. It could as well be. And you could I, have could, been... I could have been that girl dancing on the table that you saw uh, all those years ago. Uh, there was one or two I'd rather not remember <laughs> if it was you. <laughs> Well, thank you. That's Lynn Cottrell. She's out of here now. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> oh, dear. So did you enjoy drawing? You did mention it at school. You liked needlework rather than the drawing. And your 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 uh, teacher was less than supportive. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about this drawing in this art. How did that come around? Don't go too far with it, but just, you know. Well, I, I, I can tell you this, that I didn't draw. I, I really didn't, and I, I certainly didn't draw faces. Um, most of my creativity came through needlework. I, I, I used to absolutely adore needlework. Um, so on a Saturday, I would take my earnings or my pocket money, and I would go into Northampton and buy up to Laura Ashley and buy a lot of their remnants. And by Saturday evening, I'd have a dress made and I was ready to go out in it. So my creativity came forward really in that way. From, the age, from leaving school until when I actually started to draw for spirit, I hadn't really drawn at all. Oh, that is interesting. And fact, yeah, and I can't draw. So I'm not an, I'm, I'm not an artist. So I'm completely spirit taught. That, I've never had a lesson. Well, that's very inspiring to hear that. That's fantastic. Because, uh, because you well, you know, you've seen the script. One of the questions here is, how good were you at your art? What you've just said, not very. No, not very good at all. And in fact, I believe that the reason it took so long for me to develop my spirit art um, was that the spirit world had to get my drawing up to a certain standard first, so that it could be recognised. So, at the beginning of my development, it was very much focused on drawing faces. So do we want to take a step backwards now? No, 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 it's fine. Go, go back I, to how I got there. No, <laughs> I made the fatal mistake of stepping away from the interview for a moment to stop this. Uh, the, 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 there's, um, we're, we're clipping a bit on the recording. And in doing so, I lost myself and, and okay. lost. I was listening to you. So, so tell us about your big pride, your children, and surprisingly, your grandchildren. Now, I'm a grandfather. I didn't think by looking at you, you could possibly be a grandfather mother oh i'm definitely a grandmother yes um i love i love 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 my grandchildren um i have as i've said before two daughters who are my birth daughters but i also sort of adopted another daughter she was uh 13 when she came to us her name's laura and she was going through a very difficult time in her life things weren't great for her within her home life and she came uh, to be a babysitter for my children when she was about 13 years old um, and I got home one night and my daughters were standing in the hallway with Laura and crying and um, and the oldest one looked at me and said mummy Laura's mummy is moving to Norfolk um, and Laura doesn't want to go. She can live with us, can't she? And so Laura moved in when she was 13 and lived with me until she was 33. <laughs> so Although I've only got two birth daughters, I consider I've got three daughters and all three have two children each. Um, Laura is expecting her third. So I am expecting my seventh grandchild. If you are able to see these pictures, I'm not sure that we're going to use a video, but if you are, you will not believe this lady is that old. You're very kind. I think um, we need to get you to Specsavers. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Look, I'm only trying. I'm looking. To, I'm, I'm, <laughs> You're really doing trying. well. You're doing well. So Saying on all a, the right things. Let, let, let's have a look, uh, little bit look, uh, closer look at your personality. On a balance scale, what are the percentages? I think you said this earlier on about introvert and extrovert. I ask everybody this because I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited because this straight line introvert, extrovert, or this gauge is wonderful. It gives me an idea and a lot of people an idea of your personality. So you've already said you think you're 50 50 on the introvert extrovert. absolutely i do i do see why people would say that i'm very extrovert i am quite confident and and what i do in in my day-to-day -day life and what i've done in my day-to-day -day life has put me in front of people in a lot a lot of cases so i'm very comfortable with being in people's uh, company. I'm very comfortable with standing up and talking in front of people. So that would make me appear to perhaps be more extrovert than I am. But I think there's an introvert in there because I do I do like my own company. I do like to be solitary sometimes. I like, uh, you know, I have no problem with drawing all day long. You know, I can get lost in a painting um, and be very quiet. So I think there is definitely two sides to me. So that's that Gemini, Gemini coming out again. Well, that's interesting because one of the things I strongly believe in is that um, some people say they can't stand up in the church and do philosophy or they can't do this and they're, they're scared about doing this, that and the other. And I've always believed that if you have the knowledge and the belief in something, then you will find confidence within it. So you've, you're you saying that you're happy to stand up in front of people. Your day job, as you say, is you're a medium, a spiritual medium as well. Would that come down? So you're saying that confidence is because of your belief and faith and yeah knowledge. absolutely because of my knowledge and I, and, and I think that everybody feels more comfortable when they're talking about something they know about you certainly would 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 retract or go within yourself if you were asked a question that you didn't feel sure of the answer to so I think that's the same for everybody but yeah I, I certainly think that being part my spiritual journey has brought this extrovert side of me yes. out more yeah that's yeah the, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, at the moment, if somebody called on you and said, could you do a speech for us, please, in front of the WI or whatever for two or three hundred people and you can choose whatever subject you like. At the moment, you'd be fully confident and be able to do that as as most of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if yeah, you no took problem. that away and said it's not to do any, with anything like that or you didn't weren't involved with spirit yourself that introvert side would be in charge, wouldn't it? I think so. And I also think that even before uh, speaking to you today, uh, when you were setting up all your uh, equipment and you were doing your, your run-throughs at the beginning, I went within myself and asked the spirit world to help me to be clear, to be able to enunciate, to be able to make things understood. Um, I just went within myself for a moment or two. I went solitary and then I allowed myself, my personality to then be guided by the spirit world. So I think it's, I do think it's a combination of the two things, I Trevor, I really yeah. do. I'm just making some notes there because I cock up so many times. I've just realized I'm not checking in with spirit and uh, getting my words right with them. That's the problem. So we're coming to exciting part of this uh, for me <laughs> anyway, Lynn, I believe you were in your thirties from what we said in the intro before the spirit world came to the forefront in your life. So you've got, the, you've got the stage now for 10 minutes. Tell us about it. Okay. So um, you want to know the story of how it all came about. It's quite a long story I'm, and it's quite a, fun, don't quite worry. a funny one. Some of okay. us, some of us listening to this are on long journeys. So you've got plenty okay. of time. All right. So at that particular time, I'd had a seriously bad back for probably eight or nine months. I'd been in severe pain and so much pain that I think when pain is really bad, it robs you of your personality. And I really felt like my personality had, had disappeared. And I was in a very bad state. I was uh, uh, being looked after by the doctor and the hospital. And this particular week, I had been for an appointment with the hospital and they had told me that they wanted to put a small metal support into my spine to support the rest of my uh, journey through life because they said that the wear and tear on my spine was not very good and obviously I was in quite a lot of pain so this was how they could sort it out. At the same time they told me that if they did this there was only 50% chance that it would work 
and also that if I had it done, it would need doing again every 15 years. So if you can imagine being a 30-year-old woman being told that there's only a 50% chance that you're going to come out of this okay, and if you come out of it okay this time, in 15 years' time, you're going to have to have it done again, I was devastated, absolutely devastated. So I came away from the appointment in a, in a real state. And um, I think the appointment was on a Friday, and then over the weekend I'd had a lot of tears and uh, a lot of thinking about things. And on the Monday morning, I got up and I thought, I'm going to go and see a healer. Now, I've never, I ha- that up to that point, never had anything to do with healers, and anything to do with spirit, anything to do with anything. But how did you know about healers? Well, I just, I suppose I must have, uh, uh, my, my knowledge must have just been through things that I'd heard, and I'd heard about faith healing. And I think I'd got to the stage where I was desperate. So anyway, I looked in the local uh, yellow pages, as we had those days, and found the name of a healer and an address in Kettering, phoned up and made an appointment with this gentleman and set off later that Monday morning to have my appointment. Surprisingly, when I got to the address, it was a television repair shop. And I remember standing outside being a bit confused and thinking, well, surely there should be some sort of doctor's doorway or or something, a waiting room or something else here other than a television repair shop. And I walked up and down the street and couldn't find anything else. So I knocked on the door of the television repair shop and went in. And there was a man with his hands in the back of a TV, all oily and greasy. And I said, I wonder if you could help me. I said, I'm looking for so-and-so, the healer. And he said, oh, yes. He said, that's me. And he took his hands out the back of the television and said, if you just go through that door at the back, can you show me a little door? Then I'll come and join you. And I thought, this is odd. This is, but there's a, a point at which you don't know what you're, what you're letting yourself in for. So you just go through the door. So I went through the door into this little back room and there was obviously one of those therapy beds there and a, a, a little donations tin. And he said. Hello, Trevor here from Spirited Talk podcast. Remember, this is a free podcast service. If you would like to contribute towards the costs and towards future episodes, why not check out our patron page? There you will learn of the ways you can contribute and receive some of the awards, including automatic entry into the monthly prize draws for you contributors only. Thank you for listening. And of course, thank you for your support. Uh, just jump up on that bed he said I'll just wash my hands he said and I'll come and join you and he went away he washed his hands came back now I'm not going to talk about what happened next but all I'm going to say to you is that man was not any sort of healer that anyone would want to go to okay so suffice to say that the healing did not last very long I was devastated absolutely devastated I walked out of that room and home in tears It was the most horrible experience. So as I'm walking home, my telephone rings and it's my husband. Now, my husband had a business which was fashion accessories. So if you can imagine anything that's not clothing. So things like handbags, hats, scarves, glasses, you know, anything that you could consider was an accessory. And his business was his business. I wasn't really involved in it. This particular day, this particular call, he said to me, Lynn, I'm going to an appointment today and I'd like you to come with me. He said, I'm going to see a lady and she has for sale some very, very different types of handbags. And she, he said, I really like your opinion on them. He said, you'll understand them far better than I will. Well, I hadn't told my husband at that point that I'd been to see the healer. So he didn't know anything about where I was. And I said, well, I'm not home at the moment. I'm just on my way home. I said, I will go home, get changed. Will you pick me up? And he said, yes. He was in his office. He said, yeah, I'll come and get you. He said, make arrangements for the children to be looked after. He said, and we'll drive up to Hertfordshire and we'll go to this appointment. So I went home dressed in a lovely white cream suit, high shoes, you know, all all, uh, very businesslike. Jumped in the car and still hadn't mentioned the healer. And because of what had happened at the healers, I decided not to tell him because I thought he'll go to that place, pin the man up against the wall and 
that what happens afterwards won't be very pleasant. So I decided that I wasn't going to say anything about where I'd been. Um, and I managed to pull myself together and he arrived home, picked me up and we drove one and a half hours into Hart, deep, deepest Hertfordshire to meet this, la- this lady in a, and, and look at her handbags. So if I tell you then that when we arrived, it was this lady's husband that answered the door and he invited us up. It was, a, it was like one of those industrial units so from the outside it didn't look like anything at all but we went up a staircase and as we got to the top of the stairs the whole place was full of scarves and hats and beautiful colors everything was beautiful everywhere and so we went into this office and he said I'm really sorry but my wife isn't available at the moment he said but um, she's just she's going to come in just a minute will you will you make yourselves comfortable I'll make you a cup of tea so he left the room And there were chairs everywhere, but there was one particular chair that looked nice and comfortable. And over the back of the chair were lots of men's ties, which had been glittered. So they were like novelty ties for Christmas, and they'd got novelty things on. There's glitter all over them. But they were all laid over the back of the chair. And I was thinking to myself, well, that looks like a lovely, comfortable chair, but I can't put my back on those uh, glittery ties because I'm I'm, going to squash them and, and I'll ruin them. So I was fiddling with the chair to try and get organised and into the room burst this lady. All I can say is your idea of what a medium looked like years ago with flowing clothes and big earrings and loads of hair and very extrovert. And she came barging through the door and she said, Lynn, Lynn, I've been waiting for you. And I looked at my husband and he looked at me and I thought, well, I I didn't know he would told her that I was coming. And he looked at me as if to say, I didn't tell her you were coming and I didn't tell her your name. And we were like, we were both a bit startled. And she said, sit down, sit down. And I said, well, I'm just trying to sit on this chair. I said, but there's lots of things in the way. And she said, no, no, just sit down. And as I went to sit, she said, oh, you've got a bad back. And I said, yes, actually, I have got a bad back. She said, yes, your grandfather's telling me. Oh, and I wow. thought, this is odd. And at this point, my husband's mouth has dropped open, mm-hmm. you know. He's not even been welcomed. It's him that's going for the appointment. And she's totally focused on me. And she said, um, yes, your grandfather's telling me this, and he's telling me that, and he's telling me this. And I'm thinking, as I'm listening to her, I'm thinking, well, that's all very well, but my grandfather's dead, you know. And yes, you're right, because some of the, all the things that she was saying were correct, but it hadn't, I hadn't associated at that point that she was having some sort of conversation with him in the spirit world. It just seemed really odd to me. And I was listening to everything she said and looking at my husband, who's looking very puzzled and worried. And then she said to me, and your grandfather's telling me that he was a gardener. Okay. Now that's not remarkable evidence in normal circumstances. But she then went on to say he looked after a number of gardens uh, for big properties, big houses. And I said, yes, he did. She said, so he wasn't just somebody who liked gardening. She said he was a man who was in charge of a gardening team. And I said, yes, that's correct. And she said, he's showing me. And she then told me the names of the two properties that my grandfather looked after the gardens for and I was like how does she know this but she didn't give me a chance to ask she just went on and she then said you are uh, your grandfather's telling me that he's bringing you um, a bunch of flowers now at this point I started to get a bit tearful because my grandmother's name was Rose and I thought to myself if she tells me those flowers are roses then I know this is my grandfather So she looked at me and she just, as though she'd read my mind, she said, your grandfather's giving you roses. And I just burst into tears, absolutely burst into tears. And uh, it was almost like she had healed some huge wound from years ago. And, you know, I don't know. I I can't tell you, but I cried. I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. And at that point, she said to my husband, she said, this isn't about you. She said, this isn't about the handbags. She said, you have brought Lynn here to meet me today, she said, and uh, I want you to go with my husband because I want to take Lynn to my home. I want to give her some healing. So, so at this point, I am sobbing. If you can imagine, my makeup is running down my face. I'm covering crying my now. Wife. 
<laughs> covering my white suit. I was in a right old pickle. She took me outside and put me in her car, which was an American uh, Jeep type thing, but it was definitely American. And I didn't know where I was going. My husband went with her husband off to the pub or wherever they went to, d- to discuss business. And she took me home to her house, uh, which must have taken about 10 minutes. And then when I got to her house, her house was full of crystals and masks and um, everything that you can possibly imagine to do with being a medium she put me into this little room on again another couch and she put earphones in my ears like like I've got now and she said just lay listen to the music she said and just cry until you don't need to cry anymore well that was about one o'clock in the afternoon and I was still crying at five o'clock in the evening when she came in to the room and she came into the room with a pair of pencils in her hand so for those of your your lit listeners who don't know what plimsolls are they're the sort of uh sports shoe that you wear at school so they're like like converse or or trainers that you would know of today she gave me these plimsolls and she said come on we're we're, we're going out we're going out and I said what about my husband she said oh he's fine he's with he's with my husband he's in the pub it's no problem uh she said but we're going out we're going to give thanks for the sun and I remember listening to those words and thinking This is just bonkers. I'm going to give thanks for the sun. What am I going to give thanks for the sun for? Anyway, I suppose I've cried so much. And I suppose all my defences were down. So the part of me that would normally have said, I'm not going out into the woods to give thanks for the sun, just wasn't there. If she'd said to me, I'm going to fly you to the moon, I think I'd have followed her. So I just put these pencils on and followed her out to the car. And what was really interesting at that point was that we then went and picked up five other women. And they were all tumbling into the car. And they all looked like her with the big earrings and their flowy clothes. And each one, as they got into the car, had bought five or six of everything. So there was like candles and things like that. They'd all bought things for me. So we drive about, I suppose, about 15 minutes and then we get out of the car and we are at the edge of some woods. And I am there thinking to myself, I am going into the woods to give thanks for the sun. This is just crazy. I'm with a load of crazy women. Am I going to survive this? Because there was such a big part of me, Trevor, that was thinking, I'm going to be the sacrifice. Am I actually going to? survive this they're taking me into the woods i'm going to be a sacrifice here anyway i follow them along a pathway and by this time i I am i'm very wrung out if you can imagine all those tears i'm very wrung out i'm very fragile i'm very vulnerable and i followed them along a pathway and it got more and more that the woods got more and more deep so almost the foliage was everywhere and the the lady who had initially um taken me home with her took a big machete out of her bag and started cutting away the foliage so that we could walk through along this pathway. And I was horrified. That I really thought I was going to die. I thought, my goodness, where am I going? You know, but there was no fight in me. I just followed. So I followed all these ladies. She cut this pathway through the, the forest and we suddenly came upon a little hidden stone circle. So I have no idea to this day if that stone stuck and it's still there, but it certainly was there at that time. And she sat us all down in this circle. She bought blankets and so had the other ladies. They lit some candles. And she then started to say to me, look, we're going to give thanks for the sun. Uh, we're going to give thanks to the spirit world. All I want you to do, she said, is close your eyes and just listen to my voice and just let yourself go. Just, just come with us on this journey. So. I sat there with my blanket around me and listened to her voice and she got a drum out and she started to drum and she said, I'm going to call in the power of the four directions. And at that point, when she sort of started to drum, she started to say this prayer and call in the ancestors from all the directions. And the trees above me started to sway and the wind started to blow. And it was almost like she was summoning up some power from somewhere that really I was just in awe of. Anyway, I thought, I'm not sure about this. I'm going to close my eyes. So I closed my eyes. And then she started to speak. And she got us all blending with a tree. 
So she sort of took us into this nice, gentle meditation where she made me feel like I was going to sort of become the tree. And as she started to talk, sure enough, I, in my mind, started to blend with this tree and I started to feel like I was the tree. So again, I think that she'd, all the tears had opened up something in me that allowed me to just go with this flow. So I could feel myself growing as a tree. I could feel my arms reaching out like the branches. I could feel the insects on the bark and the birds in, nesting in the tree. I could feel the wind in the leaves. I mean, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. And then I heard her say, right, now now go down into the roots of the tree. And um, and in my mind, I was in a roller coaster and I was heading down like, almost like a wormhole, heading down the inside of one of these roots um, at 90 mile an hour. And I, it was like being on a roller coaster with all colours flashing past me. And um, it was just incredible. In the distance, after hurtling down this wormhole for some considerable time, um, in the distance, I could hear a voice. And this voice was saying, Lynn, it's time to come back now. Lynn, it's time to come back now. And my the hardest thing I have ever had to do was to somehow make this roller coaster stop and allow my mind to travel back into the here and now. Um, so I pulled myself back and opened my eyes, and there I was still sitting in the woods. And I've got more to tell you, so I'll tell you in a minute. Absolutely. This is such a good story. Ladies and gentlemen, we are actually going to end this episode now. So if you want to hear the rest of the story, tune in on the next episode, which if you're uh, subscribing, it's the next episode, which will be out tomorrow. For the moment, Lynn, thank you very much for sharing your story. And that brings another episode of Spirited Talk to a close. Just before you leave, don't forget to subscribe to us on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. If you want to become one of our valued contributors, check out our patron page on our website at spiritedtalkpodcast.com. And Spirited Talk Podcast is all one word. Alternatively, you can visit patron directly at patreon.com. That's patron.com forward slash spirited talk there you'll learn how you can sponsor an episode gain access to additional sound bites and be entered into our monthly prize draws and get a chance to win a prize finally a big thank you to my guest today and a huge thank you to you for listening my name is trevor goodbye <laughs>